Beautiful, and thank you for those who are following the classes online as well, um, and for those who are uh, physically present with us. It's a blessing to have you. Um, I like uh, the way we do it right now, the speed. I just want to make sure before we uh, start with a silent time and a word of prayer to welcome you, everybody, for, to continue that class in all uh, submissiveness to the Word of God and so on. I just want to tell you that tonight, this is week number four. We have no interruption. We don't hit any long weekend, uh, of course, being Tuesday. So we have four sessions in July. So one, two, three, four weeks in July. This is the first of July today, the first week, July the 7th. I don't know. I will see how we fare, but we will use July in totality for sure. And then if I feel uh, to uh, use the month of August, I will not pass the 11th, okay? I know that people are away. Usually I don't touch August, but if I have two this year, since the borders are closed and so on, it's tape. And if you plan to travel, we will accommodate you, but I will not pass the 11th. I think we should be done with August the 4th. I'm gonna try to condense everything for July, but I don't wanna crash it in any way since it is of crucial importance what we do in this class concerning the eight mysteries of uh, the New Testament. Write down your questions later on if, uh, if we have time. In the course of time, I will answer some of them. So let's uh, take our silent time in our soul to settle down because people drove from different corners of the Vancouver Island and just to make us prepare tonight for what, what, what we are just about ready to receive. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence within us. We thank you for your presence in this class also. But thanks again for the indwelling of every believer. It's good to meet in, the, in this capacity, Lord. Thank you for the thirst that we nurture to learn from your word. And thank you, Lord, creator of all things, the universe and all things within to stoop down, Father, at our level and make yourself be discovered. You could have hid yourself from your mankind, Father, from day one, and nobody would have found you. But you love the human race, you love the cosmos, and you have provided, fa Father, a way to get out from the claws of Satan, to bestow upon us by our faith, that we may sustain a relationship with the Lord Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for this plan of salvation, Father, and we thank you for your choice of us. For that reason, Lord, I'm asking you to open our eyes, the eyes of our soul, that we may tonight behold wonderful things from your law. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn on page 6 of 11. page 6 of 11 on your outline. And if you take your outlines, you should be on page 6. Uh, go back, maybe just, no, don't go back. Last week, we studied extensively together the, the aspect, the multifaceted aspect of the kingdom program. And let me tell you something without pride. There are seminaries in North America they don't even teach what you have been learning concerning the, theocr the theocratic kingdom, the messianic kingdom, the universal kingdom, and all these things, and specifically the mystery kingdom, this aspect. So the one pager that we gave you last week, the kingdom of God or heaven program, cherish it, keep it preciously, because there is good percentage of chances that you might not be exposed to that kind anymore. And then we finish by explaining, because of the nature of our classes here, which is the eight mysteries of the, um, the New Testament, we studied the mystery kingdom. What is the mystery kingdom? That's the aspect that was not revealed in the Old Testament, which has now been revealed in the New. And Christ Jesus has made him so kind that he explained to us through the parables when they are taught in, con in, in, con in context, we have nine parables that will explain the nature of the mystery kingdom. 
And when, when we explain the nature of that aspect of the kingdom, you are directly related to it. If I we do a eight session on the theocracy of Israel, you cannot relate because we're not Israel in the time of the kings nor the monarch and so on. But this explanation of the nine parables of the mystery kingdom is for here, now, as we speak. It's not necessarily past and future, although it has a past aspect and a future aspect, but it will explain why the cults and so on and so forth. So the purpose of a parable tonight, it's not to come uh, study all the points of it. It makes basically parables, make basic points of it. And Jesus right now, through his, through his word, will give us the parable of the mystery kingdom, the aspect of the kingdom that was not revealed in the Old Testament. And for that reason, you're going to need to be on page six and follow from your Bible. So I would like you in your Bible to turn into Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 to 23. That's the parable of the sower that we will be speaking about right now. The parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is the most important parable to understand because it lays the ground for the eight parables given after that. Can you, without losing your page in Matthew, go to Mark chapter... <clears throat> Just a second. Can you go to Mark chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken? Can you go to Mark, sorry, chapter, I'll give you the chapter because I'm using different sets of notes here. Mark verse 13, Mark chapter 4 verse 13. I think I am mistaken right there. The of the no, I just look for some. Mark chapter 12. It's Matthew chapter 12, but I wanted something in Mark also. Mark chapter 12. Yeah. 66. Sorry to bring that confusion right off the bat at the beginning like this. It's, it's uh, the parable of the sower. Oh, yeah, that's an important one, isn't it? Like, yeah. Just a moment. I will find it in a moment. Go to Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Okay? Mark chapter 4, verse 13. I'm sorry about that. Okay? Mark ch chapter 4, verse 13 here. It says, And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? How shall you know all the parables? just to show you that the parable of the sower is the most important parable to understand because it lays the ground for the eight that follows. So that's why the parable of the sower will be explained by himself right now. Okay, so right now I'm going to use Matthew. Let's go to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 3 to 23. Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 to 23. That's where he gives the parable of the sower. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 to 23. Come with me. He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up, circled beside the road. Others, on verse 5, fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depths of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell upon the thorns, circled thorns. So you have beside the road, rocky places in verse 5, and now others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good ground, good soil, and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has an ears, let him hear. Okay? Like I said, based upon the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 13, and I repeat, to understand the first parable properly in its context will be necessary to understand the eight that follows, 
or many of them if you want to. There are motifs in them that will be helpful to understand the rest of it. And it talks about the mystery kingdom from which the church is very much part of. The church is not the totality of the mystery kingdom, but it's very much part of it. Let me make here four points concerning the parable here. And I would like probably right now to make a comparison, but four points right now for the time being. The mystery kingdom will be characterized by the sowing of the gospel seed. Yes, the mystery kingdom will be characterized by the sowing of the gospel seed. That's what the church should be doing, sharing the gospel. Pardon me? The gospel seed. Number two, within the mystery kingdom age or the mystery kingdom alone, there will be different preparations of the soil. There will be different preparation of the soil. There will be different preparation of the soil. And because there will be different preparation of the soil, there will be degrees of responsiveness. Two. There will be degrees of responsiveness. Okay? Like I said in the past, if you send missionary to Mexico, to Cuba, they respond very well. If you send missionary to Saudi Arabia and Syria, you will have a tougher ground. So there will be different responses, different preparation of the soil. This is exactly the age that we're in right now. The mystery kingdom will be characterized by opposition. Three fronts. What you suffer in your Christian faith, you suffer opposition from three fronts. I gave them the last week, I think. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay, the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is your point three. The mystery kingdom aspect will suffer opposition from these three fronts, okay? You look at the news type of thing, people behave a certain way. The flesh is yourself, okay? The love of pleasure and so on, and the devil trying to snatch away what's being sown in your soul right now to keep the people from maturing. We're still on Arabic number one. Number four, it will be marked by different responses to the seed sown. It will be marked by different responses to the seed sowed. The seed is the gospel, and people will respond to the gospel in different ways. Now it's going to hit home a little bit. I repeat briefly what I just said, the four points. Mr. Rickingham characterized by the sowing of the gospel. You can see the gospel as a seed. Within the mystery kingdom on the globe, because the church is universal on the globe, there will be different preparation of the soil. That's why different country, they answer to the gospel in different ways. Number three, the mystery kingdom Embrace these three fronts of warfare. I don't feel like to go anymore. The world system, afraid of getting the virus, the flesh, your own desire, and the devil, and so on. Combined together, you're therefore right. That's why we need protection. Number four, the mystery kingdom will be characterized or marked by different responses to the scene sown. Now, Play with your fingers with me, okay? 
Let's compare because he taught the parable himself. He gives the interpretation himself because it's one of the most important to know. Go to Matthew verse 4 of chapter 13 and play with your fingers. That's the wayside, fell beside the road. And then he gives the explanation of what it means in verse 19 of the same chapter. Push your finger on it. Verse 18, it says here then the parable of the sower, because this one is explained to the disciple. So verse 4 goes with 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. Verse 4. Do you understand? Yep. This is the, the interpretation of it. We call it the wayside. That's when you share the gospel and the person is, is, the person is completely irrespons irresponsive. The birds, circled the birds, came and snatched them up. Circle your birds. Pick up the seed and nothing ever comes of it. Okay? There is no birds here? Okay. Yeah, does not understand. And the evil one, circle evil one, okay? The evil one will be okay. I will explain it later, okay? Circle evil one. All right? There was the word birds in circle. Who has the birds? Okay. In verse 4, yeah, in verse 4, you have the word birds. And the birds came and ate them up. Okay? You need to correlate your verses. Pay close attention. So that's when you share the gospel today. Some churches, that's why we have the gift of evangelists. They evangelize, but not everybody comes to faith. So Satan is there to snatch the seed of it. Second response. Place your fingers in verses 5 and 6. And 2021, I read them. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depths of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Okay, that's the parable. Now he explains it. 20 to 21. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, you see it refers to that, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it, circle receives it, with joy. Yet he has no firm root in itself, but is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Okay? That's the one who hears the gospel, believes it. Okay? I'm contrary to many teachers that put them in unbelief. No, he receives it. Okay? But that person, listen closely, he receives it. Now you will relate to a lot of people in your own local church. He receives it, but that person is not rooted in the Word of God. No serious Bible study. Consistently fed on milk. That person remains immature. Okay? That pictures the mystery kingdom. That's exactly the pews of the church age is full of that. They're not stable in doctrine. Pressure from the family. That's it. Later on, yes. They are not stable in doctrine. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. They are not stable in doctrine. Tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. One day Pentecostal, return to the Baptist, Pentecostal again, no church for 16 years, back to a church, no stability. Experiences oriented, ups and down. Bounce off the wall, and all of a sudden, isolated in depression. And they never leave. That's the type of people which are not capable of leaving the milk of the Word of God. Does it, is it clear and it's crystal clear. It depicts exactly what the mystery kingdom is. You with me? Meaning the church. The church, the mystery kingdom, because the church equates it for that period of time. Did you say isolated and depression? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. The isolate. You know what the people who I, I'm tired of going to church cannot sit on a chair everywhere. They are found everywhere, but not grounded anywhere. 
Okay? It hits home. Don't take it personal right now. I teach the parable in the context. Come with me. The third response, Matthew 7. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up, choked them out. Now you need to compare that with verse 22. Verse 22, and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, circle the thorns, correlates to verse 7. This is the man who hears the word of God, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Okay, it becomes unfruitful. So it means that to a time, he was fruitful. So you cannot qualify that person as being unsaved. Okay, this one has more knowledge of the word. This one has more knowledge of the world. His problem or her problem, it's to apply what he knows. He keeps it in the head, does not apply it. Okay, in everyday living. And he is overcome by the cares of the world. Family oriented, whatever it could be. The world comes first, and it choked the fruitfulness of the person. Not, reprodu not reproducing what he should. He knows his theology slash bad application. The church is full of this. They know their theology, but they can't apply. That's the parable in this context. Francois, what does it depict? It depicts the mystery kingdom equivalent to the church age now. Believers. Yes. How to respond to the gospel. Correct. Okay. Not reproducing what they should. Good theology. Bad application. They are safe, but they have serious growth issues. No, they don't, they don't gradually. They stay that in, in a state of immorality, not immorality, immaturity. Yes, yeah, so they're unfruitful. Is that like the fig tree that withered away? That's it. Yeah, they're unfruitful. You're right. Number four, verse eight. Another fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. You compare that with verse 23. And the one on whom was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word of God, understands it, who indeed bear fruit and brings forth a hundredfold, sixty, thirty. That's the one among your churches that is rooted in the word of God, unshakable. He knows how to apply it. He is not overcome by this. This come in seconds for that person. He moves from milk to ribeyes, the meat, and he produces as a disciple of Christ. So only one is not safe. The one that when Satan, the bird, snatched the, 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 the seed away, there is no response. So now picture that. Do you think that all the people in your churches on Sunday morning are safe? Answer me, please. No. Do you think that you have people that remain in a state of, uh, of immaturity for a lifetime in Christianity? Yes. Do you have the Bible Jew that knows everything but applies nothing? Yes. And do you have good people in your church that bears fruit, serve the Lord, and uh, do a good walk and a good application? Yes. It's exact. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you label where you are. I'm not, I'm not there to do that. It's difficult to teach this. Tell me if you've heard that in church. No, you did not. No, you did not. You did not. I promise. Shame. You heard all kinds of parables always twisted out. It's, it, it gives us a picture through the Holy Spirit of what the mystery kingdom is all about since we don't have the messianic kingdom that was rescinded last week. So we, the rescindants or the postponing of the, that we wait for the Messiah. It, it has become to the point that some of your pastors, of people who are sitting here, your pastors are amillennialists. They don't even believe in the kingdom. Can you, have, can you reach maturity in the faith by being amillennialists? The answer to that, beloved online, is no. What did you say, millennial? Amillennial. Don't be living into the thousand year kingdom to come. Which is the majority of the trend in Canada right now. 
They don't tell you this. But here we study the scriptures. They produce 100, 60, 30, depending on how the person is living, not how the, the lifespan. The second parable will connect with all these things. The second parable is the seed growing of itself. You have it on your outline. The parable of the seed, you know, to go, go to Matthew, Mark, rather. Sorry, I stumbled tonight. I'm a bit tired, I guess. Mark chapter 4. Do, do you understand? Oh, no, it's, no, no, that doesn't work. We need to pause. Do you get it a little bit? I need to know that. Beautiful. I'm not asking you to master these things. But keep in mind one thing, beloved, that a, a, a cell phone, a cell phone of 2,000 years ago, instead of taking pictures of what the Mr. Ricking done would be all about, he gave us his word, and it's crystal clear. It's been written 2,000 years ago. And you, you read it, and it's a crystal clear picture of what your church is all about. Don't think that your church is better than any other one. The answer to that is no. You have that type of believer in all your churches. And us as leaders or pastors, we ought, ought, O-U-G-H-T, to teach these things, to bring the people to a certain level of maturity so that COVID-19 will stop to shake you. It's time to stop it. It's time to stop it. Physical death will happen to you either by COVID or something else. Or if you don't die, you will be raptured. But again, raptured, it's a subject for the mature. Some churches, they don't even believe in the rapture. So the seed growing of itself, chapter 4 of Mark 26 to 29. And he was saying, all on the same day, the day that he was rejected, he gave this parable. The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And keep in mind the first parable. He goes to bed at night, gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself doesn't know. Circle, he himself doesn't know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts his sickle because the harvest has come. It's a very logical continu continuity of the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. Two basic points, okay? The seed sown, the gospel sown, will come to life inexplicably. The seed sown, the gospel, will come to life inexplicably. So what's the message for Francois? Francois, shoot the gospel. You're not the savior. Mm -hmm. It's like a hockey game. You want to score? There is only one way to do it. It's to shoot the puck towards the net. Might touch two legs, a shoulder, and all of a sudden, the red light is on. Score! So you're not asked to save the world. Yeah. Share the gospel. Christ will do the rest of it. So you share the gospel and you go to bed and the people are flying to London, just to give you an example, and all of a sudden on the flight, the person slang. She comes to faith because of a seed that you have sown. Does it not characterize the mystery kingdom? Number two, second point. The second point, the springing to life does not depend on the sower. I already alluded to it. Once sown the seed, once you have shared the gospel, nothing else can be done. You can invite the person for coffee. You can share the gospel 20 times a day. You sow it, nothing else can be done. It does not depend on the sower. The Savior is God, not Francois. Why? Romans 1.16. Don't need to turn. I'm going to tell you what it says. The gospel is the power of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. The power is in the gospel. Three basic points. Three basic points. Died, buried, and rose again. It's not asking you to do gymnastic and the split at the age of 75. Three basic points. Christ died for you, 
was buried for you, rose again to give you eternal life. He did it on your behalf. Schlang. It's either you believe it or not. Once you believe it, you're done. It's no, uh, you, I need to be baptized tomorrow. It's not what we're talking about. There is only one gospel that saves and you add nothing to it. Baptism is a command. It, it's a part. It's later, after salvation. It doesn't save you. Do you see the logical continuity? We take the next one, the parable of the tares. Number three on your outline, we go back to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 13 again. 24 to 30. The parable of the tares. I read two passages. You come with me in 24 to 30 right now. Okay, come. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. You circle emphatically tares and wheat and went away. But the wheat sprouted and bore grain. Then the tares became evident also. The slave of the landowner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Circle, gather them up. But he said, No, 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 no. For a while you're gathering up the for a while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Circle tares and wheat again. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. You, sir, you should circle that 20 times. And in the times of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them up into bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barns. Now, come with me in 36 to 43, same chapter, because he explained that one also. Now, when I ask you to go to 36 to 43, he explained the parable of the tares. And he left the crowd and went to his house, and his disciple came to him, Jesus, and said, Hey, Jesus, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So just as the tear are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. I make four points. The sowing of the seed, number one, will be imitated by a false counter-sowing. A false sowing. That's the one that planted tears among the field. The sowing of the seed will be counterfeited, imitated by the devil. All the gospels that doesn't work. Prosperity gospel and all that stuff. There will be a side-by-side -side development, number two. There will be a side-by-side -side development, number two. Don't be offended. In your church on Sunday morning, before the COVID, all of you were gathering. Are all the people saved in the church, in the local church? No. So, you have the wheat and the tear in the room. They grow together. Because on Sunday morning of Pascha, of uh, the Easter Sunday, you invite your family. And so, oh, I'm going to go to church that year with you. And they come five, six children and so on, and the couple, and they sit on the pews. Are they safe? Nobody knows. Some are, some are not. So, during the mystery kingdom aspect, the wheat are growing with the tear. That's the explanation of the parable. The third point here. The wheat end up into the messianic kingdom. That's the, in correspondence to the barn. It's you and I. You are the wheat and you will live out the messianic kingdom. You will be part of it. 
The tares are excluded. They don't partake in eternity nor the messianic kingdom. They don't partake in, it, in eternity, the tares, nor the messianic kingdom. You want me to they go to hell, basically, separated from God in eternity. Number four, the character of each sowing, the good sowing and the bad sowing, the character of both sowing, the good one and the bad one, will be seen by, number four, Fruitless, fruitfulness or fruitlessness. The good sowing will bear fruit, 100, 60, 30, and the counterfeit sowing, sowing fruitlessness, the cults and everything. It's exactly what we live today. You go to church, you, you have the people that either in full immaturity or not regenerated at all, they're fruitless. Okay, so the wheat and the tail will grow in the, mis in the mystery kingdom. This will not happen during the, 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 the messianic kingdom. That's representative of the age that you are in now. It's for now. Can I say the tail is unbelievers? Correct, correct. The mustard seed. Go to the mustard seed, point number four out on your outline, Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 13, 31 and 32. It's parable number four. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and become a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest on its branches. Circle the birds of the air, nest on its branches. Okay? That's the parable of the mustard seed. It's not the smallest in Israel. It's only proverbial. It's a proverb. It's a small seed, but it's not the smallest. It's not the absolute smallest in Israel. What started as a bush in a corner... When the bird, when the church began, it was a small cluster of people in Judea and Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. So it started in a small bush in a corner and it becomes basically a, monstrous, a monstrosity. That's the umbrella of last week, Christendom. That's the umbrella of last week, okay? Christendom. Two points here. What? Yeah, this is, this is the, the tree, basically, okay? Which branches and so on under, under the foliage of it type of thing, if you want, okay? It will grow as a huge out of proportion part of the kingdom with all the cults and bracing and so forth. Two points. Think Christendom right now. There will be an abnormal growth of the mystery kingdom. <coughs> Are you still with me? there will be an abnormal growth of the mystery kingdom. It will grow to a monstrosity, a huge in size. Small bush that started in 8030 will become huge because the mystery kingdom started when they rejected Christ. So it will become huge monstrosity of the umbrella of Christendom. And the second point, notice the resting place for the birds. Okay? Now you need to go back to the birds of the first parable because the birds of the first parable were agent of Satan. That's the birds that snatch away the seed. Now I don't know how to draw a little bird here, but the bird here that comes from the devil is under the tree and he swings on the branches of the mystery kingdom to have its shade under that. It's all the cultic groups, Mormonism, JW, Christian science, they fall under the area of Christendom, they swing on its branches under the protection of the Christendom, but they are agent, agent on, of Satan. They are not good birds. They are not good birds. When I was young in the faith, uh, I think when I woke up a few mornings after my salvation, 
And I read this the first time. I thought, I, I, and I love birds. I am an ornithologist amateur. And I thought that it was nice, that parable until I had to change my mind and studied. It's the same birds in Genesis chapter 15, 11. You don't remember, don't go. In Genesis chapter 15, 11, Abraham wants to sign, God wants to sign a covenant with Abraham and there is carcasses of animal cut yeah. in two. Mm -hmm. What was he driving away? Mm -hmm. The birds that was trying to eat the carcasses and the birds is a bad omen in that place. Same in the parable here. The parables are all the cultic issue that fall under the umbrella of Christendom during the Mystery Kingdom age. Basically, each branch is uh, Roman Catholicism. I will come back to that. I'm not there yet. But the branches are the branches of the Christendom. And it, it does include the Evangelical Church, the Baptist, the Pente Pentecostal, Roman Catholicism. And everything is under that branch of Christendom. Either they claim to believe in Christ, claim Christianity, good or bad. And I need to bring you back to the Lahid Highway or Victoria. On the left hand side and right hand side, right and left, you have different groups, different denominations, and you ask yourself, why? It's explained to you now. Why? Mystery Kingdom aspect. Are you sure you're with me? I look at you guys, you look like completely. <laughs> So the cults are the tares? Yeah. Anything that don't believe. Christendom. What is it? Christendom really? The those who claim Christianity be good or bad. Meaning all the denominations? Correct. All who Correct. Who, who said that they are Christian? Theology. That's it. If you talk to a Jehovah's Witness and if you ask them, do you believe in Christ Jesus? It's an absolute yes. Yeah. But th their theology is bad that because for them Christ is not God. If Christ is not God, beloved, I don't know if you heard that one before, I think you did, you can't be saved. That's right. You cannot. This is crystal clear. If Christ is not Jehovah of the Old Testament, sorry for your salvation, you've missed the mark. You need to change your mind. That's it. Even, even when I was an unbeliever, when someone would repeat that, that first verse of the Gospel of John, no thanks. It was like, there was like a ring. That's it. That I could not avoid it. Actually, hear a bell every time I was talking. Gotcha. Yeah. And it was like, even though I didn't believe, but. The parable, the note, it's okay. It's good. You see, you have an example of it. And that's what you have in churches today, depicts uh, that. The wheat and the tear growing together. And if you're not ground there, do you know that some, some Bible, ex, not Bible expositors, with your small group Bible study that you do most in the church today, some people are, that are leading it are not in, even in belief. You ask them the gospel, they don't even know where the gospel is located in the scriptures. It's a shame. That's why we at TSM do these classes. Forget the box. Uh, lots of people forget the box anyway. <laughs> but for tonight, forget it. You don't want this job. Looks great. No. Oh, the guy looks great. Uh, my, sh my, uh, my shirts are iron. My wife did it. Beautiful. Lapel mic and the camera. It's for your benefits, beloved. I still have not digested my salvation in a positive way. I can't figure out why I'm doing here. Chosen, saved forever. Where am I coming from? I don't even speak English. I'm not over it. And may God keep me in that place. I went crazy when I was saved. And I've seen so many people not grounded. End up disappointed, frustration. I threw a chair over a window in Quebec. I hated to go to church. In the first month of my salvation. And then I became what I do right now. 
And the more you know, the more you suffer. You grieve for those who stay in immaturity. Beloved, apart from old girl right now, I have no men to talk to, not very much, to be on the same page, to talk theology. I'm a theologian. It's boring. Theologians are boring, except when they have fun. But it's so important for me to transfer these things, knowing, unfortunately, don't be offended. If you are offended, so be it. You're not going to get it in church. We need to grow together. Don't abandon your church. That would be sinful for me to say such a thing because you cannot abandon the assembly. But strive to be under a good umbrella. Be choosy for what you're told from the word. Always address the issue in love if the teaching was false. But some of us, beloved, in a state of maturity, cannot even discern false teaching. You, they throw amen to everything. Amen. Amen. Don't be too quick to throw an amen. Ponder it. Recook it. Freeze it. Unfreeze part of it. Refreeze the rest of it. It's going to take you only a lifetime. Amen. I think when we use that term maturity, sometimes it bothers me because if, if it's used by itself, it, it has an implication that you've made it. We're all in, in a process Sanct of maturity. No, no, I don't want you. It's not the correction. I, it's, it's sanctification. Nobody has it all together. Yeah. But too many Christians are stuck right now in the... Too many. We have some mature uh, KN... Jack. George. Jack. Okay? Now, we have some. are disappearing. Get, get me. That pictures. If you, it, you never reach perfect knowledge. You always strive in sanctification to know more. And once you, you are fully mature, you lose your mind anyway. You lose your memory. So you never reach the full maturity anyway. So it's, it's, the parable of the... We pause. We lose our money anyway. <laughs>